The dragons are among the most notable and powerful enemies found in Elden Ring. These creatures can be found throughout all of the lands between, and they are as diverse as the landscapes they inhabit. You may be surprised at just how much of this world ties back to the dragons. So let's explore each of them one by one to uncover the secrets that they hold. And if you're a fan of Elden Ring lore, be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell icon for future content. And check out theashenhollow.com for all of my social links and merch. In this video, we'll be covering each dragon in the order that they're most likely to be encountered by the Tarnished, which makes the Flying Dragon Egg Heel first on our list. The first mention of the dragon comes from a man named Yura. Before even introducing himself, Yura warns the Tarnished to steer clear of Agheel Lake. In his words, A dragon roosts there, and it's as fearsome as it is majestic. So, unless you're mad, or wish to be burned alive, stay clear of the lake. We'll quickly see that the last part of Yura's warning wasn't rhetorical. The cycle of life and death in the lands between has been corrupted, and those known as the Tarnished often go mad from their inability to die a true death. To properly end one's life, different types of flame are often used to burn away bodies and souls alike. The Ag Hill Lake is occupied by the dead, who gazed at the skies over the lakes of Limgrave, praying that the dragon's flames would burn them to ash. The flying dragon Agheel fulfills this wish, soaring overhead and burning the undead with a wave of flaming breath. Should the Tarnish choose to fight, Agheel demonstrates the power of the dragons with a flurry of claws and flames. However, the strength of the Tarnished is not to be underestimated. Successfully defeating Agheel rewards a dragon heart, an organ that is described as terrible and savage looking but with a peculiar beauty to it. Yura reveals that these hearts are used in Dragon Communion, a ritual that can be performed at the church off the western coast by those who yearn for the strength of dragons. But his advice comes with a warning. Those who partake in Dragon Communion will one day shed their humanity, unleashing the strength of a mighty dragon along with eternal torment. Following Yura's instruction will lead the Tarnish to the Church of Dragon Communion, where dragon hearts can be consumed to learn special incantations. Incantations that grant the ability to mimic the dragon's flames and claws, acting as proof of the work done by a new dragon tracker. The next area that the Erdtree's grace will guide the Tarnish towards is Liernia of the Lakes. Here, countless green and blue crystals classified as glintstones can be found scattered throughout the shallow waters. Golden amber is described to contain the remnants and vitality of ancient life, and with glintstones being the amber of the cosmos, it holds the vitality of the stars, and allows one to cast the spells taught by the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. Students need a special key to grant entrance into the Academy one of which can be found by a meeting place of now-deceased sorcerers. However, this key is guarded by the sleeping glintstone dragon Smarog. His abilities are mostly identical to that of Agheel, but instead of breathing regular fire, he breathes a blue glintstone-tinted flame. Smarog was a devourer of sorcerers, and over time his body became corrupted by glintstones. These crystals embedded in the armor and weapons of the Rhea Lucarian sorcerers are the reason for Smarog's hide being covered with glintstone, to the point where it almost seems parasitic. Though, even after Smarog's defeat, other glintstone dragons can still be discovered. Behind Caria Manor lies the Three Sisters, where the glintstone dragon Agila resides. Much like Smarog, Agila breathes a glintstone breath and is covered in crystals. But the color of Agila's glintstone is a much deeper shade of blue. Agila also has abilities beyond that of Agheel and Smarog. 
as shown by the usage of her homing crystals and a spectral blade of ice. Before the Tarnished can defeat this dragon, however, Adjula flies away and magically vanishes into the sky. This fight will need to be finished another time. After chasing off Adjula, the Tarnish comes face to face with the Lunar Princess Rani. She opposes the Erd Tree and the Golden Order, but her fate is tied to the stars, which are being held in stasis by the one known as the Star Scourge, General Radon. Rani's war counselor E.G. reasons that if General Radon were defeated, the stars would once again resume their movement and restore Rani's fate. This means that the next step is to find and kill General Radon in the rot-infested lands of Kaelid. Here lies the Dragon Barrow, where the Elder Dragon Grail is being protected by what seems to be her offspring. This massive creature's roar weakens the tarnished and strengthens nearby dragons, but it's not capable of doing much more than that. Killing the surrounding dragons will cause Grail to die, and likewise defeating Grail herself will kill all of the surrounding dragons, with both outcomes granting a total of five of their hearts. Grail is described as the mother of all dragons, which makes sense as her anatomy closely matches that of every dragon previously seen. This also includes the flying dragon Grail, whose nearby location and similar name to Grail both suggest some sort of close relation. Yet one exception to this trend exists in the Church of the Dragon Communion, where the corpse of something with a different type of head, wings, and claws can be found. But we'll touch on that subject again a bit later. In the southern region of Kaelid, a dragon named Exekes guards a distant building. While Exekes resembles the other dragons, his body is completely covered in rot and wounds. The Scarlet Rot of Kaelid is shown to infect almost all forms of life that come into contact with it. And while Grail and her kin seem to be mostly unaffected, Exekes wasn't as fortunate. Instead of breathing any type of fire, he breathes a rotten fog that reflects his state of decay and disease. Exekes is also described as the Dragon Communion Revenger, and he did not forget his hatred even as he succumbed to the Scarlet Rot. It is likely that most dragons condemned the practice of Dragon Communion, as it requires their hearts to be harvested and consumed as a part of that ritual. After his defeat, we see that Exekes was actually guarding a second location of where Dragon Communion was practiced. Much like the church in Limgrave, this cathedral houses the corpse of a stone dragon with unique anatomy, along with something that resembles a baptismal font, filled with a bright red liquid. Here, the Tarnished gains access to new incantations, including the signature abilities of each major dragon previously defeated. As of now, this includes Agiel's Flame, Smarog's Glintstone Breath, Grail's Roar, and Exekes' Decay. However, these special incantations can cost two or three dragon hearts each. So while the Tarnished should have nine hearts by now, it would cost a total of 15 hearts to learn every spell. A new source of dragon hearts will be needed. Luckily, the creatures known as magma worms hold these needed hearts. These worms somewhat resemble the dragons, but their scales are darker, their heads are flatter, and they have arms separate from their wings. Additionally, the worms show the ability to spew magma and wield a massive greatsword. One of these worms can be found in Kaelid. Another two are found around Mount Gelmir, and a fourth named worm guards one of the entrances to the Altus Plateau. This is Magma Worm Makar, who is classified as a great enemy. Upon its defeat, Makar drops the Magma Worm Scale Sword, which explains that these land-bound dragons were once humans who partook in dragon communion a grave transgression for which they were cursed to crawl the earth upon their bellies, just a shadow of their former selves. 
Now, with enough hearts to buy nearly every Dragon Communion spell, the eyes of the Tarnish may now glow yellow and reptilian. At this point, their fate is likely sealed as yet another who would be cursed to become a magma worm. For those who seek to know every draconic spell, a few more dragon hearts will be required. If you'll remember, the glintstone dragon Agila is still alive, and in order to find it, we must continue to follow Ronnie's quest. Upon defeating General Radon, a path to the eternal city of Nakron will be opened in Limgrave. After traveling through Nakron, providing Rani with a weapon capable of slaying the Two Fingers, and passing through the second eternal city of Noxtella, the Tarnished will reach the southern plateau of Liernia. Four Glintstone Dragons reside here, three of which will drop one heart each. The fourth is none other than Agila, who now fights to the death, as if there's something here worth protecting. In addition to three dragon hearts, Agila will drop their signature Moonblade sorcery upon defeat, which describes how Agila, a devourer of sorcerers, was bested by Rani, and subsequently swore a knightly oath to her dark moon. This answers why Agila was found outside of Rani's Rise and the Cathedral of Manicellus. These are both locations where Rani the Witch can be found and Agila has taken a vow to protect Rani and follow the wisdom of the Dark Moon, which acted as the guide to the countless stars. With six new dragon hearts, the Tarnish should have more than enough to learn every signature incantation of the dragons, and can now proceed onward to the Altus Plateau. If the Tarnish proceeds through the rune-strewn precipice where Magma Worm Makar was defeated, they are likely to have an encounter with the ancient dragon Lanisax. Swooping in and attacking near a side of abandoned coffins, Lanisax is noticeably larger and more powerful than most dragons that have yet to be found. Her appearance is also unique, but looking back at the stone corpses found in the Dragon Communion Church and Cathedral, we'll see that they all share the same anatomy. Lanisax demonstrates the ability to control red lightning, but similarly to Agila, she flies away before she can be defeated. Fortunately, the nearby royal capital Leyendel holds plenty of clues to the true nature of the ancient dragons. For example, the weapons used by the Draconic Tree Sentinels are described to be whittled from the claws of a great ancient dragon, and since these are enwreathed with lightning, they tear through the dragon's feeble descendants with ease. This shows why Grail is described as the mother of all dragons, but has a different anatomy compared to the stone corpses and Lanisax. While the ancient dragons had scales of gravel stone, wielded lightning as their weapon, and had a pair of arms separate from their four wings, Grail would be the mother to a modern, weaker generation of dragons that lacked these traits, who would instead possess different types of elemental breath. While within the walls of Leyendel, another ancient dragon corpse that rivals the enormity of Grail lies across the city's architecture. This was Granisax, who once rained calamity upon the royal capital, the only time in historical record that Leyendel's walls have fallen. This marked the dawn of the war against the ancient dragon. The forces of Leyendel, along with Godfrey's Crucible Knights, would retaliate against Granisax's assault, culminating in a fight where Godwin the Golden defeated the ancient dragon Fortisax and befriended his fallen foe which was an event that gave rise to the ancient dragon cult within the capital. Lanisax, who was the sister of Fortisax, would come to support this newfound group. It is said that she took on the form of a human to commune with the knights as a priestess of the ancient dragon cult. Members of this cult were able to channel the red lightning of the dragons, and in some cases, those loved by the dragons could survive cladding their entire bodies in lightning. Vike, who was a knight of the Round Table Hold, even learned special incantations of his own. Of all the knights, Vike the Dragon Spear was the one that Lanisax loved the most. 
We never get to see Lana Sachs's human form, but she can be found for a second fight near the capital's rampart side path. While defeating her grants the incantation of her signature red lightning glaive attack, Lana Sachs does not give up a dragon heart, adding another layer of separation between the ancient and modern dragons. To understand what became of Lanasax's sibling, Fortisax, we must first explore the history of Godwin the Golden. This demigod was the offspring of Queen Merica and Elden Lord Godfrey. Long ago, a fragment of the Rune of Death was stolen in what was known as the Knight of the Black Knives, and with it, the Black Knives planned to create a rune of their own. They were able to catch Godwin and begin to curve out this rune on his back. But before this process was completed, another demigod perished at the same time, breaking the curse mark into two half wheels. Because of this, Godwin died in soul alone. Now his disfigured, half-dead corpse lies at the root of the Erd Tree, and has since become the source of Death Blight, Death Root, and those who live in death. However, a few characters, such as the deathbed companion Fia and Sorcerer Rajer, seek to normalize those who live in death, and to do so, they must restore both half wheels of the curse mark that the Black Knives intended to create. The Tarnished can choose to help with these goals, ultimately leading to a moment where Fia's deathbed dream can be entered by the base of Godwin's corpse. This initiates a fight with the Lich Dragon Fortisax, who has now been corrupted by Godwin's death blight. Instead of the standard lightning strikes used by Lanasax, Fortisax utilizes Death Lightning, a corrupted version of the golden lightning that was wielded by Godwin. While Lanasax was known for her glaive of red lightning, Fortisax's twin red lightning stakes were the hallmark of the ancient dragon who was called the mightiest boulder stone. It's not entirely clear why Fortisax is inside the deathbed dream, but after Godwin the Golden became the Prince of Death, the ancient dragon fought long and hard against the death within its companion. Unfortunately, victory was never achieved, and its only reward was corruption. Much like Lanasax, Fortisax's death does not yield a dragon heart, reinforcing that this trait is only shared by the modern dragons and the magma worms. As the Tarnish proceeds beyond Leyendel and into the mountaintops of the Giants, there is one final modern dragon to be defeated. Borealis, the Freezing Fog, can be found hidden within a blizzard on the frozen lake. Borealis is classified as one of the Ice Dragons who were once lords of the mountaintops long ago until they were defeated by the Fire Giants and chased from the peak. Despite this, Borealis remains in the mountains, and several outside forces have since banded together and defeated the Fire Giants, including another who borrowed the power of the dragons. The Elden Lord Godfrey led the war against the giants, and other forces such as the Heroes of Zamor and the Sorcerers of the Briar helped in this battle. However, one particular group opposed the giants from within. The trolls who were descended from the giants were lesser giants who fought for the Erd Tree during the war against the giants long ago. Perhaps the most notable of these was the ancient troll warrior Theodorix, whose name lives on as a hero. However, a magma worm called Great Worm Theodorix lives deep within the consecrated snowfield. While Theodorix is the strongest of the magma worms and drops triple the normal amount of dragon hearts, his fate acts as proof that even the strongest warriors can fall victim to the temptation of the dragon's power. Time and time again, we see that attempting to control this power ends in ruin. Godric, who viewed the dragons as trueborn heirs to the throne, fails to defeat a singular tarnished after grafting the head of a dragon onto himself. Eleonora, who was considered a hero, partook in Dragon Communion, but her pursuit of power led her to the madness of the Bloody Fingers. Even the Eternal Cities made an attempt to create dragons of their own, but the Dragonkin never knew a true sky nor true lightning, 
And while they were able to wield ice lightning, they never attained immortality and perished as a decrepit, pale imitations of their skyborn kin. The only exception to this trend was the Dragon Cult, who defied this fate by being blessed and loved by the dragons themselves. Nearing the end of their journey, the Tarnished will later arrive in crumbling Faramazula. Countless dragons can be seen circling this floating mausoleum, marking this as their true home. In addition to the ancient dragons, the ruins of Faramazula are home to the Azula Beastmen. These ruins are said to be the remains of a giant mausoleum enshrining an ancient dragon, guarded by chosen beastmen who wield weapons clad in lightning. While this dragon lord is nowhere to be found, their importance is made clear by certain artifacts found around Faramazula. One example is their scales that also happen to be scattered throughout this area. The ancient dragon lord's seat is said to lie beyond time, and this stone lightly twists with time. The Drake Talisman describes how the ancient dragons, who ruled in the prehistoric era before the Erd Tree, would protect their lord as a wall of living rock. This also is shown within the walls of Faramazula itself, which appear to be partially made from the stone bodies of ancient dragons. These corpses also contain traces of gold, explaining why the Erd Tree's forces were so willing to form the ancient dragon cult. The worship of the ancient dragons does not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree. After all, gravel stones and lightning itself are both imbued with gold. There's also a hidden talisman that depicts an old lord with two wings and four dragon heads. Whoever this dragon was, it seems like they were at the core of Faramazula's purpose. While this being is described to lie beyond time, there is one way that the Tarnished can confront them. Faramazula is constructed from the graves of the Chosen Beastmen, and along a crumbling path beneath the mausoleum, there lies an unoccupied beast grave. The Tarnished can lay inside until time freezes, reverses, and resumes in a time before Faramazula was destroyed. Here, Dragon Lord Plasudasax floats in the air, motionless, with both of his heads poised upwards with an eerie calmness. The Dragon Lord, whose seat lies at the heart of the storm beyond time, is said to have been Elden Lord in the age before the Erd Tree. Once his god was fled, the Lord continued to await his return. While this god isn't explicitly identified, it's possible that this could have been the Greater Will, or perhaps a more primordial version of it. This arena is also the only location where Mikola's Needle, which was crafted to ward away the meddling of the Outer Gods, can be used. Some things to note about the Dragon Lord's anatomy include his head shape and the number of his heads and fingers. While Placidusax more closely resembles the ancient dragons, his head shape matches that of the modern dragons, with another similar head being found within the dragon temple of Faramazula. And while Placidusax is shown with two heads, the old lord's talisman depicts a dragon with four heads, and the number of visibly severed stumps suggests that he may have once had up to five heads in total. As for his fingers, there are five on each hand which, interestingly enough, matches the Beastmen of Faramazula, whose five fingers were symbolic of the intelligence once granted upon their kind. This, of course, was one of the traits lost by the modern dragons, as their claws had been merged into their wings. As the Tarnished approaches, Plasudasex descends from the sky and shows why he is worthy of the title of Dragon Lord. On top of the ancient dragon's red lightning, Placidusax summons a huge spiral bolt of lightning that takes the shape of the signature bolt of Grandsax. He can also breathe golden flames, disappear into storm clouds, and shoot beams of destructive light from both of his heads. While this may be the strongest foe the Tarnished has yet to face, no dragon was ever proven to be unbeatable. After so many victories as a dragon tracker, not even this prehistoric lord should stand a chance against them. 
After his defeat, the remembrance of Placidasax is all that's left behind. The final remnant that both commands great power over the dragon and holds the dying whales of the dragon lord, who once dwelled eternal beyond time. <laughs>